As we begin our study of hermeneutics, it's important that we start off with asking the question, why? Why do we need to study interpretation? Why do we need to think about interpretation? I guess we could take a step back first, though, and ask the question of just what is hermeneutics? Simply put, hermeneutics is just the study of interpretation. The word hermeneutics comes from the Greek word hermeneuein, which means to explain or interpret. But again, that brings us back to the question of why we need to start by thinking about interpretation. Why is it necessary for us to spend time wrestling with this question? After all, you've been reading texts since you were about six years old. You've been reading the Bible since you became a follower of Jesus, and that might have been around that same time. So the question is, why do we have to spend any time thinking about this? You've been reading the Bible for a long time. You're comfortable with it. You're competent at it in many ways. I had a student a number of years ago who put the question this way. He said, why can't we just read the Bible and go from there? That's a fair question, and I think it deserves an answer. And so I'd like to spend the next few minutes taking a look at five reasons why I think it's necessary for us to think carefully about interpretation and why we can't just, quote, read the Bible and go from there. The first reason why it's important that we think about hermeneutics is because interpretation is a necessary part of true communication. Interpretation is a necessary part of true communication. The fact is, you use the principles of hermeneutics every day in your life. When you have a conversation with someone, when you're watching TV, when you're reading anything, you're engaging in interpretation. There's simply no such thing as communication without interpretation. I want to illustrate this with an example. It doesn't come from the Bible, but I want to show you that you are already using the principles of hermeneutics. What we're going to do is simply apply these principles to the Bible. But take a look at this sentence. I like dogs better than my wife. Now, as you look at that sentence, I want you to think for a moment about some possible meanings that this could have, some possible intentions that an author or speaker would have in saying the sentence, I like dogs better than my wife. Now, the first is fairly obvious. Maybe the speaker has problems with his wife, and so he's talking about his problems, and he's come to the realization that things have gotten so bad that he likes dogs better than his wife, and that would be what he wants to communicate. Another possibility is that he's a dog lover, but his wife is not. And so what the sense of this particular sentence would be is that he likes dogs better than his wife does. Now, there are probably more interpretations. I can think of a couple more, but we don't have to spend time thinking about that. But the question that we need to raise is, if these are both legitimate possibilities, possible things that I like dogs better than my wife can mean, how do we know? How do we know which is intended, which is the correct interpretation in a particular situation? The key is interpretation. In this case, we would apply contextual clues to help us understand what a, the person speaking who says I like dogs better than my wife, what they mean when they say this. So suppose that you have a, a good friend and the good friend comes to you and he's sharing with you his problems in his marriage. And he's sharing with you that things have, have really deteriorated, things have gotten really bad. And finally in frustration and sadness and maybe even some anger, he says, I like dogs better than my wife. Now in that scenario, you're probably not gonna respond to your friend and say, oh, didn't she have pets growing up? The reason is because you understand what he means when he says that. Or if you're at a dog park and you're walking your dog and somebody comes up and is petting your dog and is raving about how much he likes your dog and he talks about the fact that he doesn't have pets and that he had pets growing up all the time but his wife didn't, and then he says, I like dogs better than my wife. In that situation, you're probably not going to respond to him and say, oh, well, have you considered marriage counseling? And the reason you wouldn't consider that is because you understand exactly what's meant, and you picked up on contextual clues. That's a part of interpretation. And in a normal conversation, you engage in this sort of interpretation all the time. You're not conscious of it, but you're doing it all the time so that you don't make the kind of mistakes where you, you think that someone who says this is, uh, is sharing with you problems with their, 
spouse when in fact they're talking about the fact that they like dogs better than their wife does. To get a bit more theoretical, interpretation is necessary because we human beings are finite creatures. We are limited creatures. God is infinite. Human beings are finite. And because we're finite creatures, we can't read the minds of our fellow creatures. And so if someone says, I like dogs better than my wife, we can't read their mind and know just exactly what they're thinking and what they mean. So we have to look for those clues, contextual clues, for example, as we talked about. And that's engaging in interpretation. And so because we can't read each other's minds, interpretation, therefore, is always a necessary part of true communication. I want to suggest to you that as long as one party to a communication is a finite being, then interpretation is necessary. Now, when we come to the Bible, we need to recognize that the Bible is God's word to human beings, but God is an infinite being. But I said that as long as one party to the communication is a finite being, then interpretation is necessary. Human beings are the interpreters, the receivers of God's word. And when we further recognize that God's word is communicated to us through finite beings, then we recognize that interpretation is necessary. When we read any biblical text, we can't simply know exactly what the author is thinking when they're writing. We have to engage in interpretation. And if we don't, we're going to misinterpret the, what, exactly what they're saying. Now, I want to suggest to you that perhaps within the Godhead, with, which is infinite beings, then interpretation is not necessary. In other words, when the Father seeks to communicate to the Son or the Son with the Spirit, interpretation isn't necessary. And the reason is because each one of those persons can know the mind of the other. There's no interpretation necessary. So interpretation is necessary not because we're fallen creatures, but because we're finite creatures. The fall certainly complicates interpretation. Because of the fall, we have a tendency to read texts and listen to things in a, a more selfish way than, than before the fall. But even before the fall, when Adam and Eve are trying to communicate to each other, they would have to engage in interpretation because they're finite beings. So interpretation is a necessary part of true communication. Texts are about communication, and therefore, we need to engage in interpretation so that we can understand exactly what is meant and what is uh, intended. So that's the first reason why we need to think about interpretation. The second reason is because the variety of genres in the Bible makes interpretation necessary. The Bible is full of a number of different genres. Genre, if you may or may not recall from your high school English classes, genre is just a, a word that means type of writing. Now, you're familiar with this, again, at a, a popular everyday level, and I want to illustrate that. Suppose you're reading a magazine and you come across the headline that says, Ford, quality is job one. And there's some text that accompanies this particular headline. And I hope you recognize, by simply looking at it, that the most likely genre, the most likely type of writing represented by this headline in the text that accompanies this is an ad. It's an advertisement. And in an advertisement, the author or authors of the text have a particular purpose in writing. Their purpose is to persuade you. They want to persuade you to buy a Ford car if you're in the market for a car. They want to persuade you to have a positive view of the Ford Motor Company if you're not in the market for a car so that when you are looking for a car, you'll, you'll, think, of, you'll think of Ford. And the way they do that is to, to use language that evokes emotion on your part. They don't have to be completely accurate in everything they say, or at least not scientifically accurate. And if you ask the question, are the people writing the text that accompanies this headline biased? The answer is, of course. It's written by the ad executives of the Ford Motor Company, and they want you to have a positive view of this. So you wouldn't expect the text that's accompanying this headline to be objective in its presentation. And you know this, and you know this because you've been taught how to interpret the genre of advertising. You may not remember when you were taught this, but this isn't just obvious to you. you. You had to be taught this. I remember when my son, my oldest son is now 17, but when he was about, I think maybe four years old or so, he came running up the stairs to my wife and he said to her, we have to buy a swivel sweeper. 
And my wife said, why do we have to buy a swivel sweeper? And my son said, because it's awesome. And he had been watching TV and there was an infomercial for swivel sweeper that came on. And of course, in the infomercial, they extol the virtues of the swivel sweeper. And my wife had to teach my son that in advertising, they're not necessarily telling you the full truth. They're not telling you the objective truth. And they're trying to get you to buy what they are selling. That is part of recognizing the conventions of the genre of advertising. And you were taught that at a young age. Again, you may not remember it, but you were taught this. And you apply that now as you're reading a magazine and you come across this. You apply this unconsciously. We can further see this when we look at another headline. This one says, Ford Explorer Safest SUV According to Highway Safety Study. Now here, if there's text accompanying this article, or this headline rather, you would hopefully recognize that this is probably a different genre from the, the previous one. While it's true that there can be ads that look like this, most likely this is going to be a news article. And the conventions associated with the interpretation of a news article are different. You have different expectations of the news article when you're reading. You expect, for example, that the people writing this are going to be more objective. They're striving for objectivity. If the writer has a financial interest in the Ford Motor Company where they benefit from you buying a Ford Explorer, then you expect that they would disclose that or that they wouldn't even be writing this particular article in the first place. You would expect that the safety study is going to be described. There's going to be facts that are presented. Now here again, you understand the conventions of the genre of a news article. You were taught this at some point. You have learned to read carefully. This is called genre sensitivity, and you engage in this on a regular basis as you're reading a, a magazine or a newspaper, online articles, whatever it might be. You understand that there are different rules associated with the interpretation of different types of writing. So you don't read an ad in the same way that you read a news article. You don't read a, an opinion column in the same way that you read a news article or an ad. They have different conventions associated with them because they're different types of writing. They have different purposes. And you engage in this genre sensitivity all the time. What we need to recognize is that when we read the Bible, we need to engage in the same type of genre sensitivity. Sometimes people have the idea that the Bible is a genre of its own. Now, I guess in one sense it is. That is, it's inspired by God, and, and so it's different from others. But the reality is that that inspired word is presented to us in a number of different genres. Within the Bible, we have poetry, we have prophecy, we have epistles, we have law, we've got narrative. So a number of different genres represented in the Bible. And each of those genres have different conventions associated with them. There are different rules that we need to apply in order to better interpret the biblical texts. And just like if you apply the conventions of an ad to a news article, you're going to misunderstand that article. You're going to miss the point, or vice versa. The same thing is true when it comes to reading the Bible. So in response to my former student who said, why can't we just read the Bible and go from there? Because we need to recognize that the different genres have these different conventions associated with them, and we can't treat them all the same. In fact, one scholar maintains, rightly in my estimation, that meaning is genre dependent. And by that, they mean that the meaning of the same words can be different depending on the genre. Now, I can illustrate this in a, a very simple way and imagine that you stand up and you're walking and you trip slightly. Uh, you, you stumble a little bit. And I say to you, <laughs> nice job. Now, you presumably understand that if I were to say that in that situation, I'm being sarcastic. And you understand that my meaning is not that you did a nice job, but in fact the opposite. But suppose that you are uh, doing something and, and you've just finished something, you've done a really great job at it, and I say to you, nice job. Now, the words are exactly the same but the meaning is different depending on the situation. Now, that's not genre, different genres, obviously, but the principle you can understand by, by thinking about it this way. And the same thing is true when it comes to different genres. Meaning is genre dependent. And because of that, we have to engage in interpretation. When we're reading biblical poetry, we can't apply the same conventions or rules as we apply when we're reading biblical narrative. 
we're going to misunderstand what's going on if we under if, if we fail to properly apply the right conventions for the particular genre that we're interpreting. So that's another reason why we need to be thinking about hermeneutics. The third reason why we need to think about hermeneutics is because the cultural and historical context in which the biblical authors and their audiences lived is different from ours. The cultural and historical context in which the biblical authors and their audiences lived is different from ours. We need to recognize that when we read the Bible, we are not reading a text that is a product of our culture. The context of the biblical authors and their audiences is very, very different from ours. I can illustrate this here when we consider the following sentence. It says, due to all the whinging, I gave my poppet a new nappy, tea, and a kip. Now, this may not make much sense to you. It makes sense to millions of English speakers throughout the world, but they don't, for the most part, live in the United States. This is British English, and this makes perfect sense to people living in Great Britain, probably people in Australia as well. Whinging is another word for fussing. Poppet is a term of endearment for a, a child. Nappy is a diaper. Tea, we'll come back to in a second. A kip is a sleep, a nap. So in in our parlance, we would say something very different, but this is how they would express this in, in Great Britain. Even the word tea has different connotations for us as, as it does compared to how the British understand it. The word tea can mean the drink, obviously, but it can also refer to afternoon tea, and there are different types of afternoon tea, or it can refer to the evening meal. And so we would put this in American English by saying, due to all the fussing, I gave my baby a new diaper, a supper, and a sleep, or a nap. Now, what I want to suggest is that if we don't understand the context, the, the fact that the, the context of the speaker who says this particular sentence, then we're going to misunderstand what's, what's going on. In the United States, we don't generally have the institution of, of afternoon tea. We don't refer to an evening meal as tea. And so we're going to misunderstand at least that aspect of it, even though we understand the meaning of the word tea. There are all sorts of examples that we could give from the culture of, of England and other even other English-speaking uh, countries when it comes to this. I lived in England for four years when I was doing my doctorate, and we came across so many instances where we ran up against cultural differences, and uh, those were surprising to us in some ways. Now, I want to suggest to you that there is probably no country in the world except for Canada that's closer to the United States in terms of culture and worldview and language than Great Britain. Again, Canada probably is, certainly is. But beside that, then most likely England, Great Britain, is the country that is most similar to us in terms of culture and worldview. And yet there are many things where we differ, where we don't understand. Now, if that's the case, if we have a hard time understanding things from a country that has all sorts of shared values, shared history, uh, shared language, how much more difficult is it for us to interpret texts that are the product of a culture that is so vastly different from our own, and we're interpreting texts that are not written in our own language, and they have a culture and a worldview that is very, very different from ours. It raises the stakes in interpretation. We can't simply assume that we understand things. Let me illustrate this with a biblical example. If we take a look at what's presented here in Luke chapter 10, verses 29 through 37, it says, but he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. 
Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. Now, I want you to think for a minute of what we call this parable. You all know the name of this parable. It is, of course, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we're familiar with this parable. It's told in all sorts of settings. We know this as part of the part of the Bible. And the idea of a Good Samaritan has crept into our thinking in, in the Western world. So in the United States, we have Good Samaritan laws in just about, I think, all 50 states. And those are laws that say that if, if someone is rendering aid to somebody else, um, they're not going to be sued for malpractice because they're not in their clinic or, or whatever the case may be. If we were to do that word association test that psychologists use, you're familiar with this, where uh, a therapist will say a word and the, the patient is supposed to say the first word that pops into their mind when they hear that particular word. If we were to do a word association test in the United States, my guess is that somewhere north of 95% of the population, when they hear the word Samaritan, is going to say the word good. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves, though, is not what do we think about Samaritans, but what does Luke think about Samaritans? What does Jesus think about Samaritans? And my guess is that if we were to go back into the first century and do that word association test, very, very few people, of the Israelites at least, are going to say good when they hear the word Samaritan. Instead, when they hear the word Samaritan, they're going to say things like half-breed, idolaters, unclean, enemy, something like that. And so if we don't understand the cultural setting in which Jesus is, is engaging in his ministry and Luke is recording, we're going to misunderstand this particular parable. I've heard folks interpreting this parable, and they talk about how the point of this is that we're supposed to be nice to each other. We're supposed to take care of each other. Now, that's obviously true. That's not what this parable is about, though, because what Jesus is doing is he's He's teaching the, the teacher of the law not to draw lines between who's in and, and who's out. And he's trying to challenge understandings of that. That's the point of this. And there's a, a significant reversal here. This is like the, in our culture, it would be something like the, the parable of the good child molester or the parable of the good terrorist or something like that. It doesn't compute. It doesn't make sense, and, and that's the way the first century audience would have responded to this. Now, we don't have that same effect, and the reason we don't is because we're so familiar with this passage. We're so familiar with how our culture has adopted the idea of the Samaritan that we don't actually have the same response. But if we import our 21st century understanding of the word Samaritan into Luke chapter 10, we're obviously misunderstanding what Luke is doing with his recording of Jesus, uh, Jesus' words here. So we need to approach the text recognizing that it is not the product of our culture. It is not the product of our time and place and language. It's the product of a very, very different culture. I want to encourage you to think of reading the Bible as a cross-cultural experience. When you read the Bible, you're engaging in a cross-cultural journey. If you were to take a physical journey to a different country, you're not going to expect everything to be the same as it is at home. You understand that things are going to be different in different places. And, and the same thing is true when we're reading the Bible. We have to recognize that we're going on that cross-cultural journey. We can't expect things to be the same as we go from our world into the world of the text. That's another reason why we have to engage in interpretation is because we have to be aware of those differences. We can't just read the Bible and go from there. If we do, we're going to misunderstand the word Samaritan, for example, in reading Luke chapter 10, and that's going to distort our interpretation of what Luke is doing in, in this particular passage. The next reason why we need to think about interpretation is, is related to this, fairly, fairly similar. And that is that each interpreter approaches the text with a number of, of presuppositions that affect interpretation. Now, we were just saying that interpretation, I'm sorry, that reading the Bible is to go on a cross-cultural journey. This next point has to do with what we bring with us on the journey. 
that when we're reading when we're reading the Bible, going on that cross-cultural journey, we bring luggage with us. We bring baggage with us. And that luggage is important. That baggage is, is very important for us. We don't want to go someplace and not have the right clothing. We want to have the clothing that's appropriate for the particular climate. At the same time, we need to recognize that we can bring stuff that doesn't really help us very much. If we're traveling overseas to a, a location where the electrical system is different and we bring a, a hairdryer from our country without a, a converter or transformer of some sort, then we've wasted our space in our, in our luggage. And so the presuppositions that we bring affect our interpretation of the text in, in some pretty significant ways. We all bring luggage with us. Once again, let's take a look at an example. This is from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Jesus is uh, talking to his disciples about who, uh, who he is, and I won't read the whole thing, but Peter, in verse 16, talks to Jesus in response and says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now, for those of us who are Protestants, and I'm assuming that's most of you, given that you're students at Bethel Seminary, but for most of us who are Protestants, we're used to thinking of this as the establishment of, not of Peter as a, an authority in the church, that is the Pope, but instead we make a distinction between Peter on the one hand and his confession on the other. And so we'll sometimes hear people talking and they'll say that in Greek, the Greek word for rock is Petra. And when he, Jesus refers to Peter, the word Petras is used, the masculine form. And there's a distinction being made between the rock on the one hand and Peter on the other. Now, grammatically speaking, I don't think that holds up because if you want to refer to someone, a man, you have to make the feminine form of rock into a masculine form so that people understand what you're talking about. So what I think is happening in this passage is that Jesus is saying that Peter is going to have a, a significant role to play in the early church. Now, I'm not a Catholic, so I don't believe he's establishing the office of the Pope that's then passed on in apostolic succession from one Pope to, to the other. But I do think that what's happening is that Peter is being established as having a, a significant role to play in the life of the early church. Now, I was sharing this interpretation with a friend of mine, and a, this friend grew up in the Catholic Church, and he was very hurt by the Catholic Church, and he was somewhat anti-Catholic as a result of his experiences. And when I was sharing this with him, I, I told him that what I had just shared with you, that I believe that this is establishing Peter in a particular, particularly important role, not drawing the distinction between Peter on the one hand and his confession on the other. And my friend's response was interesting. He said, that can't be right. That can't be the correct interpretation, because if it is, then the Catholics would be right. Now notice, that's not an argument against what I was saying. He's not arguing from the perspective of Greek grammar on this point. He's not arguing a theological point, uh, really not an historical point, cultural point, anything. He's simply basing his interpretation on the fact that he didn't want the Catholics to be right. Now, that's how presuppositions function. In that case, his presuppositions about the, the truth and goodness of the Catholic Church was affecting him in his reading of, of a text, or at least his, my description of the reading of the text. And I want to suggest that we all do this to some extent. We're all influenced by our familiar interpretations of the text, our theological systems that we ascribe to, our denominational commitments when it comes to, to certain things. And we're unaware of the fact that we're being influenced by these. Yet this is one of the most important aspects of interpretation, is to be aware of what we're bringing to the text. In other words, when we think about that question, why can't we just read the Bible and go from there? One of the answers to that is because what we, what we see in the text is influenced by our experiences of the text, our theological systems, our own personal experiences, that sort of a thing. Another way to think about this, if we shift the metaphor a little bit, is to, to think of presuppositions as the lenses that we wear when we're reading the text. So if I'm wearing red lenses, wearing red glasses or red contact lenses, and I look at a white wall, 
I'm going to see that wall as red or pink. Now the wall is not objectively red or pink, but I'm seeing it that way because I'm wearing those lenses. And if I'm not aware that I'm wearing those lenses, I'm going to be convinced that the wall is objectively red or pink, whatever the case may be. And if you come along and you're wearing blue lenses and you look at the wall, you're going to say that it's blue. And so we're going to look at the wall, both of us thinking the other is crazy because it's clearly not that, because that's what we're seeing. That's how presuppositions function. And so one of the aspects of interpretation, as you're going to see, is to identify our presuppositions, to reflect on the things that we're bringing with us when we're reading the text, the luggage that we're bringing while reading the, reading the text. I want to encourage you to, to not dismiss this, uh, because this is actually one of the most important takeaways from not just this presentation, but really the whole course, that we are not blank slates when it comes to interpretation. We are not completely objective interpreters of, of the text. Now, I want you to be very, very clear in understanding. I'm not suggesting that that means there's not an objective truth. There's not an objective meaning of the text. On the contrary, I'm going to argue there is an objective meaning of the text. But we are subjective interpreters of that objective reality. Sometimes in the past, people have thought that they are objective interpreters of an objective reality. And people have maintained that they are free from presuppositions or bias or anything that would influence their reading of the text. That simply is not the case. And we need to recognize that we are subjective interpreters of an objective reality. That's part of why we have to think about interpretation, why we have to be careful about interpretation. It's because we bring these presuppositions with us. So we have to slow down. We have to engage in some work beforehand of thinking about our presuppositions and how they're affecting our reading of the text. The fifth and final reason why we need to think about hermeneutics is this. Our evangelical commitment to the text means being committed to what the text actually means and not simply to our interpretations of it. Now, obviously, I'm making an assumption here that most of us who are participating in this are, are evangelicals. Um, you're at an evangelical seminary, and so I'm assuming that that's the case. Maybe that's not true. But uh, for those of us who are evangelicals, our commitment is to what the text actually means, not simply to our interpretations of it. Many of you will come from traditions where you'll have an affirmation of faith, and the affirmation of faith will include something like this. This is the affirmation of faith of the of Converge Worldwide, the denomination that Bethel is the seminary for. And the first article of the Affirmation of Faith of Converge Worldwide says, we believe that the Bible is the word of God, fully inspired and without error in the original manuscripts, written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and that it has supreme authority in all matters of faith and conduct. This is a very common evangelical statement about the importance of scripture. And again, notice that it says that the Bible, the Word of God, has supreme authority in all matters of faith and conduct. In my experience, this isn't always true. In my experience, we often say something like this. We say we believe something like this, but there are other things that are equally authoritative in our minds. It might be our denominational tradition. It might be uh, theological commitments. Those things that are presuppositions can also function as competitors to the authority of Scripture. I want to illustrate this by sharing with you a story from my, uh, my past. I was a naval officer uh, after college, and I was stationed in Charleston, South Carolina. I went to a church in, uh, outside of, of Charleston, and the pastor one Sunday was preaching on the issue of, of drunkenness. I think he was pre preaching from uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly. But I remember being there, and he presented his view that said that the Bible doesn't forbid the consumption of alcohol. Instead, the Bible forbids drunkenness. And he explained this based on the text. He explained this based on cultural and historical context, all these sorts of things. He then went on to say that in his view, there are all sorts of good reasons why one might want to abstain from alcohol. But in his view, the Bible doesn't forbid the consumption of alcohol. Just as an aside, I think he's absolutely right on his interpretation of that, but that's not the, the point here that we need to make. 
But after that particular sermon, uh, there was a group of women from the church who went out to lunch. And as was their custom, they began to critique the pastor's sermon. And I was friends with a woman who was there, and she shared with me the this particular uh, episode. These were some older women in the church, and they were critiquing the pastor's sermon. And one of the women in the midst of the discussion said, well, I don't care what Buster says. I should have told you the pastor's name is Buster Brown. I'm not kidding. Um, but she said, I don't care what Buster says. The Bible forbids drinking. Now, we might chuckle at that a little bit, but I want to think for a minute about what effect this would have on her witness, on her ministry. Suppose this woman was uh, to go out to lunch with a, a woman, a friend, who's not a follower of Jesus. And they go to a restaurant in downtown Charleston, and this friend orders a glass of wine. And then the woman who went to my church says to her, well, you know, the Bible forbids drinking. What view of God does that woman get as a result of, of that? My guess is uh, this is going to be problematic for her. Suppose this woman has never been drunk a day in her life. In saying the Bible forbids drinking, she's creating a, an obstacle for her, uh, a barrier in many ways that's not, that's not necessary. Because if that interpretation is correct, that the Bible does not forbid the consumption of alcohol, but instead forbids drunkenness, then there's no reason for someone to say that the Bible forbids drinking. And what's happening in that situation is that that tradition, that familiar interpretation, is equally authoritative, even more authoritative, than what the Bible actually means. Now suppose in this hypothetical scenario that the this woman's friend has been told by her doctor to drink a glass of wine every day for her heart. Now she has to choose between what she's being told is, is what the Bible teaches and what God wants and what her doctor says. It's an unnecessary conflict that's being established. And I want to suggest that this happens more often than we think. There are times where we elevate uh, familiar understandings or traditions to the place of Scripture. We think that it's based on Scripture, but they're not necessarily. And so we need to take the time to think about what the text actually means. I want to challenge you and encourage you in the course of this class to, to challenge your understanding of certain texts. I'm not asking you to question the, the deity of Christ or anything like that. You can put those things to the test, and I can promise you that you're going to find that what the authors are intending to communicate is that Jesus is God. But there are other aspects that you can put to the test. You can look at and say, is my belief really in line what Scripture actually means? Or have I perhaps elevated something to a place that's equally high or higher than Scripture? And if that's the case, then we need to challenge ourselves to, to let go of those things and have the integrity to, to let go of those things that are, that are not consistent with Scripture, but nevertheless have crept into our thinking and have occupied a place of authority beyond what they deserve. For these five reasons, we need to think about interpretation. We need to engage in the, the careful study of interpretation to know how it is that we should interpret the text. My assumption is that each one of you want to be the best interpreter of the text that you can possibly be. Being a good interpreter of, of the biblical text, being a great interpreter of the biblical text, means starting with a solid grounding in hermeneutics. It means starting with an understanding of why we have to engage in interpretation and all the factors that influence us when it comes to interpretation. I hope this has been helpful to you. I encourage you to continue to think and reflect about these things and uh, hopefully incorporate them into your thinking about what you're doing as you engage in this course of study.